Now let's talk about some additional diagnostic tests of someone under neuroassessment. These are ones where you have to go somewhere for a test, okay? First one is a non-contrast CAT scan or MRI. So a non-contrast means we don't use contrast. <laughs> so we don't inject any kind of dye. That's why we call it non-contrast. CAT scan or MRI, remember MRI is the one magnetic resonance imaging. And that is the one where you can't take anything metal in. I mean, when MRIs first started, and the first time I took a patient to an MRI, I had barrettes in my hair that are clips, hair clips that have metal on them. And I, that metal, is, that magnet is so strong, I could feel it pulling on my hair. Now it didn't pull it out of my hair, but when you go for an MRI, you take all hemostats and scissors and anything metal out of your pockets before you go in. Because there have been times when metal things have flown out of people's pockets and it shuts down the MRI. <laughs> yeah, they're not real happy when that happens. So. You'd be really careful about metal things. Your patient also can't have metal inside their body as in a pacemaker or a defibrillator. So those are important questions to ask before your patient goes to an MRI. Now, why would we do a CAT scan or MRI non-contrast for a neuro patient? Well, these can tell us the size and location of a lesion and they can help us differentiate between an ischemic stroke and a hemorrhagic stroke. An ischemic stroke is one where blood supply has been cut off, oxygenated blood has been cut off to the brain. Hemorrhagic stroke is one where we've got a similar problem except it was caused by excessive bleeding. So ischemic is a blocked blood supply. Hemorrhagic is, whoa, we've got bleeding in the head. Okay, so we would take somebody for a non-contrast CAT scan or MRI because we want to see do they have a lesion in their brain, have they had an ischemic stroke, or have they had a hemorrhagic stroke. So this would happen more than likely in the ER if the patient presented with some odd symptoms. People can develop a stroke or a neural problem while they're in the hospital for something else. So we may also do that as the first step for somebody who's already been admitted to the hospital. Now, cerebral angiography, okay, this is a, a CAT scan angiography, helps you see the cerebral blood vessels. So this helps the physician estimate the perfusion and look if there's any filling defects in the cerebral arteries. I, had a f I still have the friend who had postpartum preeclampsia, and they thought she was having strokes, but when they did her cerebral angiography, they found out that it wasn't strokes, even though it looked like that, but the cerebral angiography helped them visualize the blood vessels so well. What they figured out was it was just cerebral vasospasms. So the great news was she wasn't a 32-year-old having strokes. She just was having cerebral vasospasms, as we knew we got her past this period of postpartum preeclampsia, it would resolve, and it did. But please be aware, if your patient is having cerebral vasospasms, I can't even give you a word to explain how excruciating the headaches are. They are just unbelievably intense and very difficult to relieve their pain. Makes them super sensitive to light and excruciating pain that you just can't get away from. So be very patient with those patients that you are careful with them, that you really work with them on pain management because it's difficult. Okay, so let's go back and review just really quick. Non-contrast CAT scanner MRI will let us look at the lesion, help us differentiate between ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. Cerebral angiography is gonna let us know about the blood vessels in the brain, and it helps give us an estimate of how well it's perfusing and look if there's any filling defects in the cerebral arteries. The third test I wanted to tell you about is a transcranial Doppler, or a TCD. Now that's an ultrasonography. It's a non-invasive study. That's really good. Cerebral angiography is a very invasive study. But a transcranial Doppler ultrasonography is not. So it's a non-invasive study, and it just measures the velocity of the blood flow in the major cerebral arteries. So it's a little bit faster than the other one, but it can also give us some really helpful information. Now, why is cardiac imaging up there? Because we're talking about neural stuff. Well, think about how close your heart is to your brain. So cardiac imaging is usually also recommended because many strokes are caused by blood clots that come through the heart. So that's why they may order cardiac imaging.
Now, a CTA or an MRA can also see vascular lesions or blockages. So an MRA can be really similar to a CTA. Now, the last one is a kind of a mouthful, digital subtraction and geography. Okay, this is intra-arterial, meaning in the artery, digital subtraction and geography, or DSA. It reduces the dose of contrast material that we need, it uses smaller catheters, and it shortens the length of the procedure. So that's why they might also do a DSA. Now, lastly, we've got the EEG. Now that looks like something from almost like an Edward Scissorhands movie because they come in and they glue and it is a nasty smelling glue, it's really strong, but they'll come in and they will glue multiple electrodes to the patient's head. And then they'll monitor the electroencephalogram, they'll monitor the brain waves over a period of time. This can be really helpful if the patient is having seizure activity or different problems. I know that my brother-in-law, after he had an aortic valve replacement surgery, started to have some real mentation problems. He forgot that he had surgery after he was discharged home, and so he had to be admitted back into the hospital. And he had to wear this getup. We were sure to take a picture of him and post it on Facebook just because it was fun. But he had to wear this getup for an overnight period so they can observe and see what was going on and what these episodes might be connected to with an EEG. So there you have seven possible additional diagnostic tests that might be ordered for a patient who's having a neurology problem. So again, I would recommend pause the video, go back, and if there are any details, you may want to listen to this section again just to kind of get a feel for what these tests are. Then join back up with us.